So tonight we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1. Now, the book of Genesis, just to give you a very quick overview, is commonly believed was written by Moses. Moses is uh, referred to throughout the scriptures as being the one who wrote the first five books of, uh, of the Bible, which we, we look at. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the first book, Genesis. And just to give you a New Testament reference as to why Moses is believed to have been the author, in uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus was discussing the resurrection, and he said, Concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. He was referring to Mosaic authorship of Exodus. And so there is a common belief that Moses was the writer of the law, and the law consists of the first five books of the Bible. And so you see often even uh, people referring to the Mosaic authorship, nothing directly but indirectly, in that they include the law under the writings that were inspired by God, and, uh, and that Moses was the one that God inspired to compile the, uh, the history of man from Genesis throughout the first five books of the Bible. The word Genesis is a Greek word. It means beginnings. And the reason that this book is called uh, Genesis is because in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word, the first word in the, in the first line says beginning. And that's why it's called Genesis. And it indeed is a book of beginnings. As you go through Genesis, several things are being introduced. You're going to see God just right off the bat is introduced. He's introduced as the creator. You see the Trinity in the book of Genesis. You see man. These are first mentions. You see Satan mentioned the first time. You see salvation mentioned the first time. You see justification by faith mentioned the first time. You see the security of the believer in the life of Noah. You see the rapture in Enoch, and he was a man who walked with God and was taken away. You see the divine incarnation prophesied in the book of Genesis. You see death and resurrection spoken of for the first time, and you see the coming judgment and that's portrayed in Sodom and Gomorrah's judgment. You even have baseball in the book of Genesis. That's interesting, but in the first line it says in the big inning, and that refers to a baseball game. <laughs> that's Viola humor. It wasn't funny the first time I tried it either. <laughs> so it's indeed the book of beginnings. One of the things we need to remember, and this is something that I want to make very clear, because I'm not a scientist, I, I am not capable of giving a scientific treatise on creation. And I'm not even going to attempt to do that. But I believe that Genesis was not written as a scientific treatise. I don't believe that the Bible was written as a scientific book. I believe that the Bible was written as a book of revelation concerning God and what God says about life. So I don't look into the Bible as as a scientific textbook, but every time the Bible will mention something concerning science, the Bible is right. I don't look at Bible as a history book, but every time something is mentioned in a historical context, the Bible is right. I don't look at it as a philosophic book, but when it talks about the philosophy of man and the philosophy of God, the Bible is right. And so I look at the Bible as being God's revelation to man, and Genesis is that. It is God's revelation to us. You know, there are only two ways that we as human beings can view creation. One is through God's eyes, and the second is through speculation. Now, I prefer looking at creation through the eyes of God rather than the speculation of man. And one of the things we need to realize is that because the Word of God is the Word of God, and because the Bible is a book that reveals to us God and His ways, the Bible needs to be then looked at as being a book that is received by faith. And so the things that are said, I take by faith. There's no way a human being can verify anything uh, in even history, even eyewitnesses, outside of the Word of God. Because in secular history, you know that every event that has been recorded is recorded through the bias of the viewer. And those who want to present history in a certain light will always do that. I believe that the Word of God is free from human error. 
I believe that the Bible is inspired by God, therefore is free from human deviation. Because as you go through the scriptures and you see the, the books that are written, you see the personality of the individuals who are responsible for writing, the, for writing the book, and you see their weaknesses portrayed very evenly throughout the word. And yet you see God always portrayed as being above that. God is always being divine. God is always being perfect. And the word of God is presented in that way. And because it's the word of God, I receive the word of God by faith. The word of God was written to us uh, in order that we might be profited, in order that we might understand the ways of God. That's why we're told that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction. And God wants us to be instructed from his word. So as you study the book of Genesis, that's the attitude you possess. Genesis 1 is dealing then with creation, and it is dealing with God's way of presenting how he began the universe. Now, some people don't want to receive Genesis. They would prefer their own logic and their own way of thinking. And I guess the one philosophy, and I believe it's a religious faith, that runs counter to the creation account is the, is the philosophy of the evolutionist. The evolutionist who would believe that through several different theories, there was no God involved, but that there were natural processes and that the universe is really a result of natural processes. But I don't believe that the universe is a result of natural process. Even the Big Bang Theory or anything like that, I just I don't believe that that's possible. You know, some say that there, there's a theory called the Big Bang Theory where there's a massive explosion and the universe began in a bang. And uh, I, I can't buy into that. There's a guy by the name of Edwin Conklin. He's a biologist. And, and I have a quotation. It says, the biologist Edwin Conklin, speaking of evolution, stated that the probability of life originating by accident is comparable to the probability of the unabridged dictionary originating from an explosion in a print shop. And I agree with that. You know, I agree with that. And I've discovered as I've read a little bit about evolution that evolutionary reasoning can sometimes lead the individual into some strange conclusions. Now, in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You go to uh, somebody's house and you see the house, and the first thing you do is, you, if it's a nice house, you say it's a beautiful house. Now, you don't praise the house. You don't walk up to the, to the house and just put your hands on the stucco and say, what a marvelous house you are. But you would say, if you like the design, is this is a beautifully designed house because every house is built by some man. And so if you give praise to the design, you give it to the designer, really, and not to the design itself. And the Bible says that the invisible attributes of God are seen clearly. They're manifested to man. So you step outside right now, and if it's clear enough, you can see the stars. And if you go out into the desert, especially or into the mountains, and it's very dark, and you just lay out there, and you see the wonders of creation, well, it tells you something about the God you serve, because creation is so beautiful. Everything that man makes on the outside is beautiful, but under closer scrutiny always shows its flaws. You can get the most beautiful painting or the beautiful, uh, some kind of beautiful material, anything you want, and look at it from the outside. For example, get one of those synthetic roses, and they put next to another rose, and if you step a few feet back, and if it's scented correctly, it can appear just like any other rose. It looks beautiful. But if you get a microscope and you put that synthetic rose under a microscope and you start going a little deeper into it, it shows all the flaws of it. But if you get that rose, a, a natural rose, and you put it under a microscope and you start looking at it, it gets more wondrous as you peer into it. And I believe that everything man creates upon closer looking shows its flaws. But that which God has created is only producing wonder in the one who is looking closely at it. So the Bible says that that man clearly can see the things of God, and they recognize that there's a hand involved, a designer, a great designer, who has designed the universe, and you see it. But what happens is they become darkened in their imaginations. 
the Bible goes on and says, though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And I think that is what has occurred because some of the people who write in favor of evolution come up with some incredible theories. I have one here by a uh, theory by a man uh, by the name of uh, Dr. Lawrence S. Dillon. He's an associate professor of biology at Texas A&M College. He says that man is not an animal, but a plant which evolved from brown seaweed. <laughs> so next time you're swimming in the beach, be careful grandpa doesn't grab your legs. <laughs> you know, and there are intelligent men who believe that kind of stuff. I find that interesting. I think that evolution is a, is a faith-based theory. And we need to always remember that, incidentally. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, though it's presented as a fact. And you can turn on uh, your National Geographic specials, and you can see the ascent of man, or you can see cosmos. And it is always presented as a fact. I have never heard them say the theory of evolution, though I'm certain some people do. What I hear is 60 billion years ago, 30 billion years ago, with this absolute certainty now, who's going to go back 60 billion years and be able to verify whether that's true or not? You can't verify that. The scientific method is not applicable in evolution because you can't go back and verify that through repeated experiment. And yet we hear people speaking about it, and we hear people speaking as if it's an absolute fact, something that we should just believe because every person with any iota of common sense believes it also. But I find it to be really a philosophy that's based on faith. There's a Swedish botanist by the name of Dr. Herbert Nilsson He's an evolutionist, and he says, my attempts to demonstrate evolution by experiment carried on for more than 40 years have completely failed. At least I should hardly be accused of having uh, started from a preconceived anti-evolutionary standpoint. It may be firmly maintained that it is not even possible to make a caricature out of the paleobiological facts. The fossil material is now so complete that it has been possible to construct new classes and the lack of transitional series cannot be explained as due to the scarcity of material. Deficiencies are real. They will never be filled. The idea of an evolution rests on pure belief. A transitional life form. You haven't found anything that shows a reptile and then the next form as he started growing wings to become a bird. You don't see transitional life forms. You don't see the transi transitional la life form from a Cro-Magnon man, we'll say, or somebody who is recognized by those who are into evolution. You don't see transitional life form. What you find when you have full-scale skeletons is human beings, maybe a little bit smaller, but they're human beings, and that's what you have. There are no transitional life forms. But this is a matter of faith for a lot of people. When I was in a cultural geography class in a non-Christian college, one of my professors said, you know, that he had evidence to uh, uh, that evolution was a fact. So I spoke to him after class, and I asked him a simple question. I said, have you found any, is there any verified transitional life forms? Because I know there aren't any. He said, oh, yes, oh, yes, we have many transitional life forms. That's not true. It's a fact to him, but it's pure speculation. So what I'm getting to is because I'm not a scientist, I am a person with faith. Though I'm not a scientist, I have faith. So the question that I have to rest on is, what am I going to place my faith in? Am I going to place my faith in pure speculation, where even those who are the greatest adherents admit that they have no absolute certainty as to even what they believe? Or am I going to put my faith in God and take him at his word? I would prefer taking God at his word. And that's what I do. And as I approach Genesis, Chapter 1, I'm going to approach it from God's perspective, from what God says, and I'm going to let it rest at that. Why don't we get into, then, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. In verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first thing you notice is, there is no explanation as to where God originated from. There's no, you know, you how your little kids will ask you that question eventually, the hardest question that they can ask, God, where did, Daddy, where did God come from? You know, and you, you, you say, well, God never came from anywhere. He just has always been. 
well, no, wait a minute, you know, Daddy, you know, I came from such and so place, and you came from so and so place, Daddy. Where did God come from? And that's a difficult question for us with finite minds to understand. Yet the Bible doesn't try and give an explanation concerning the existence of God. The Bible states the existence of God as a fact. And the Bible says, in the beginning, and that's it. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When it says God, in the beginning, God, that word God is a Hebrew word, Elohim. Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, Elohim. The word Elohim means gods. It's a plural word. In the Hebrew, you have a singular, which would be E-L, El. That's one. You have a dual, which is Elo, Eloi. That means two. But when you get beyond two, you have a plurality expressed with the Elohim, and this is referring to three or more. I believe that this is the first indication of the Holy Trinity in scripture. And so God's name is Elohim here. He's presented as being Elohim. He's presented as being three in one, at least, minimally. So he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word created is a Hebrew word, bara, B-A-R-A. You can add an H to that. And what that means is that he created out of nothing what there is. He created out of nothingness. That's bara. And the Bible says that God created because it speaks of the personality of our God. You see, in the beginning, God created, separates God from his creation. Now, there are philosophies today that are called pantheistic. They believe that God is in everything. God's in the trees. God's in the flowers. God is absorbed in the entire universe, and the universe is God. The root to that is Hinduism. But the Bible doesn't teach that God is in everything, but the Bible teaches that God is separate from everything that God existed prior to creation, and then God creatively began everything. So that shows to us personality, because God is separated and is spoken of as being separate from his creation, and it shows us the power of God in that he is separate in the sense that he created all things and is not one of the things that have been created. So you see that he created all things, and then you see what in the first verse is discussed. You see, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens that is being spoken of in this verse, in verse 1, is space in general. The earth that is being spoken of here is not planet earth only, but all matter that has been created. And what he's referring to is the fact that God has created out of nothing that which is. He's created the space and he's created all the different uh, um, elements that are fused together that are going to be created into planets and everything. But because this is Genesis 1-1, you're seeing just the beginning of God's creation. And God began with nothing. Then he created the space and then the matter that he was going to make into earth and planets and suns and stars and everything else. In verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So earth, matter in general, and also the earth specifically was formless. It was yet unformed. And the Bible says it was without form and it was void. Void literally means wasted or uninhabited. And that's a description of the earth at the time when God is beginning his creation. There's space, there's matter. God is now beginning to work in his creation. And so as of yet, it's uninhabited and it's without real definite form. It says darkness was on the face of the deep. And the deep is in reference to waters that were covering the earth at that time. Water that was covering the earth. And it says, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The spirit of God brooded over the face of the water. And that word hovering or brooded in the Hebrew speaks about a vibration that's taking place, like a mother hen who is hovering over her, her eggs, getting ready, ready to settle down on them and to warm them up. It's a brooding. But the Bible points to the Holy Spirit as the force of God, the power of God, the one who's energizing creation and shows him beginning to create. And it's a picture of the Holy Spirit there beginning to move upon the face of the deep, beginning his creation process of the earth. In verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. Up to that point, light does not exist. Because light is a form of energy. And God had not created light yet because he's just in the process of creating everything. 
So God speaks and he says, let there be light. Now God is capable of creating light without a sun because part of the personality or the character of God is revealed as being light in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. If you want, you can turn to that. I'm going to read the scripture. It says, this is the message, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So the creation of light was a very logical step for God. And this is what you would call elemental light. It's the beginnings of light without a sun, but it's emanating or its, its existence comes from God himself. And the Bible says that God, when he first spoke, said, light be, because literally that's what he says. Rather than getting it uh, and God said, let there be light, literally what he's saying is light be. And light was, you know, God created the light. And as we're thinking about this, you have to understand that God can create light without a generator. Now, some of us wonder, well, how can light exist without a generator? But as you look into your artificial lights, the artificial lights are just that, they're artificial. The reason that they're created is so that we can have the light in the darkness before we had uh, candle power. But we've created artificial light, why? Because we have a sun and we're used to light and we need light to continue to function. So we have light bulbs. And so we've, we've created them. But why have we created them? We have created them because we have an original source that has given us a model of light, which is the sun. I believe that God created light elementally and elementarily. He started light without the need of a generator because he was the source himself. And so you don't need to have a generator when God, in whose nature is light, creates light. And that's an interesting fact when you look in the scripture because the light existed before the sun before the stars, before anything that could generate light, light existed because God spoke light into existence right off the bat. And the Bible says in verse 4 that God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. In verses 6 through 8, the Bible says, Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Now God is now creating something that is generally called a water belt. He is dividing the waters from the waters. Now the waters that he's referring to is the, is the sea, so that water, the deep that was there, the clouds that are now beginning to form, which are vapor, which is water. But there's also an atmosphere that's being created and God has placed above the, what we would consider what we can breathe, the air that we can breathe up to the clouds. God separated that waters by, with a, and, and placed a water belt around the earth. Now, this water belt, you're going to see this, and this is the reason I tell you this. You know, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but there was no, there was no rain on earth. You know, when, when Noah uh, was commanded to go into an ark because it's going to be rain, he didn't know what rain was because the Bible says that God would water with a mist. A mist would rise up and water. And so there was no rain. There were no drops of rain. What this was was a perfectly sealed planet that was temperature controlled. And God, it appears through scripture, had a water belt that circled the earth in a similar way, perhaps in visual at least experience, like you see the rings in Saturn, where there was an actual, there was a visible water belt that separated it. And the water belt did something that is really, really interesting. Because as you read the scriptures, you find that people lived a long time, hundreds of years. Now, how did that go about, you know? Well, this water belt acted as a filter and I wrote some things down. What it did is, as a water canopy, it served to create what is called the greenhouse effect. There was a universal temperature because this water belt would filter through the cosmic rays and the different rays that would come through, it would filter it through, and what happened is it created universal temperature. 
And so everywhere, it was the same degree, probably very comfortable. Whatever degrees would be perfect, that's what it was. It kept windstorms from occurring, because windstorms are a reaction of heat and pressure. It kept windstorms from occurring. And because it stopped windstorms from occurring, it kept dust from being flying around in the air. It was a perfect place to live. Because it was a greenhouse effect, it, it, it escalated the possibility of plant life. And plant life flourished under this perfect environment. It filtered the ultraviolet and cosmic rays. And because it filtered those rays, it prolonged life. And also, it is the reservoir that God used in judgment when he opened the windows of heaven and poured out a flood on the earth. And that's what God used that water belt for. That water belt originally kept things in a perfectly controlled atmosphere. But then God brought judgment and he opened up that water belt and he flooded the earth with all that water. And that's where your first major rain came from. Verses 9 and 10 says, Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Up to this point, it was what we call the shoreless ocean. There was just ocean everywhere. So God spoke, and what happens is now the earth starts forming and the crust starts forming and the mantle starts forming and the core of the earth forms and the, and the earth is rising up and it's lifting and it's creating a basin and the basin is now inhabited by the sea and now he has an ocean with the seashore and God was speaking and he said this should be done and he said I want that dry land to appear and it was so and then God named it he named the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. Once again, God looks at his creation and says, this is good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. You know, when I was just saved, I got in a discussion with the guy who liked to smoke pot. And he told me, you know, well, you know, isn't marijuana an herb? You know, and, and God created the, the herbs, you know, and we're supposed to enjoy them, you know, and that... I understand that, that, that marijuana is a weed, though, if I'm not mistaken, you know. At least we called it weed. <laughs> the Bible says that, that God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And that grass is general ground covering. Besides just grass, just ground covering. And he says the herb that yields uh, seeds, which would be shrubbery and bushes and things of that nature and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, which speaks for itself. Fruit trees and the different forms of trees that, that we have now on earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. You know, when you get into verse 14 and it says, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons. You know, th this is in no way saying that astrology is okay because there are those who say, well, look into the heavens for the signs. And this is not what he's referring to here. What he's saying basically is he created the sun, which is a generator of light. He created the moon, which is a reflector of light. He created the stars. 
But the reason that he says that they were for signs wasn't so that we'd look up to the heavens and, and worship the creation rather than the creator and start going after these astrological signs. You know, I've, I've always found astrology to be very interesting because if you get the Daily Report or you get the Los Angeles Times or the Herald Examiner and you open the astrological columns up, and you compare what you're supposed to do, it's often intriguing where one person will say, stay in the house all day because a massive dog's going to bite you if you step out. And the other one says, go for it. You know, get outside and just be very energetic. It's always interesting to me how they contradict. And if they're looking at the same stars, I wonder how they come up with such a strange and different views of what those stars are supposed to be doing in our lives. And the Bible says that we have a personal God who is involved in our life and that in order for us to know our plan, his plan for our life, it's, it, it is not up to us to seek the secret things of God through divination or through astrology and to allow the stars to, to lead us and to, to direct us, which people do in an amazing way. But what he said is that, look, at these signs are only so that you can tell the day from the night and so you can now have monthly calendars and charts. And you can see the stars, you know, like people who are on the ocean can see the North Star and they can use it for navigational purposes. These stars are set there in such a way that they demonstrate the glory of God. The universe has been told to us as being the handiwork of God. It's the finger work, literally. And that God has shown us how incredible he is in that you can prophesy in terms of with scientific knowledge when the next eclipse is going to take place. And you can do things just by charting the stars because they're in such perfect arrangement. This is, a, this is the handiwork of God. It isn't, we haven't been called to worship stars or to look at stars astrologically, but rather that God created them in order that we might be able to see his, his beauty, his wonder. It reflects to us the power and dignity of our God, the awesome quality of our God who created all things, put them into orbit, set them there, told the stars stay right there and don't move. And this is what God did. Unfortunately, what we do with his creation is we put so much emphasis on the creation that we forget the creator. And we get so involved in the creation that we forget who created it in the first place. And so that's why God created the sun and star. It was to give us an opportunity to be able to chart, to have calendars and things like that. He called the, the great light, that was our sun. He called the lesser one the moon. And he, the other ones, he calls them stars. And that's an afterthought, incidentally, when he says that. He says, and there are also stars. He made the stars also. He said in verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures. So it's not one cell that's going to split and then duplicate over billions of years, but literally what it says is let the waters abound, let them swarm with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, God has been in the process of creation, and now he creates something, a life principle of consciousness. And he did that in these great sea creatures. He created them, and these sea creatures are the massive whales and the variety of animals inside the oceans. And he also created the birds, and he told them, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said... Let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. The cattle refers to the domestic cattle. The creeping thing refers to the smaller animals that creep around on the ground and the beast of the earth. And some of these animals were large, some of them were small, and God created them all. And he said that they were to multiply according to its kind. That's why a dog will find another dog. That's why... Uh, a cat will stay in the, with another cat because they multiply after their own kind, and that's part of God's creation. And it says, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps in the earth according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now in verse 26, we find something pretty interesting. All of this has been interesting, really, but verse 26 is really interesting because once again you see the Trinity referred to. God said... Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. 
male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, who is God speaking to when he said, Let us make man in our own image? The Jehovah's Witnesses would teach that he was speaking to his angels. But the Bible doesn't say that. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 24, God is speaking in this passage. And the Bible says in Isaiah 44, 24, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. God took total, total glory for the creation. He said that he did it all himself. There's no indication anywhere in the Bible that angels were involved in the creation of God. God takes total glory from, for that, for the creation. He never says, well, and the angel Michael helped me to do this, or Gabriel helped me in this way. You never see that indicated. What you see indicated is God saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So he was not speaking to an angelic being. He was speaking within himself. Now, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 4, the Bible says every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. And yet when we look into John's gospel, we see that all things were made by Jesus Christ, and without him was not a single thing made that was made. You find that in the first chapter. So Jesus Christ is given the credit for being the creator of all things, and yet we're told that God created all things. So what you're seeing here is God speaking within himself, and he's just he's speaking out the plans that he has. He's going to make man in his own image, after his own likeness. The Mormons say, that we have, that God has a body, that God has a body of flesh and bones, that he's physical. Well, does the Bible teach that? No, I don't believe the Bible is teaching that God was creating us in a physical body, in a physical representation. What God is creating man in is, is a spiritual representation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 I'll start with verse 23. He says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Those are two qualities of God that God created man to possess, righteousness and true holiness. You can flip over to Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. And I'll read verse 9 and go into verse 10. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So we have the capacity to know. So God created us, created us in righteousness, in holiness, and the ability to know or knowledge. And that's the image of God that you've been created in. So God is saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then he gave man dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Next week when we go through chapter 2, I'll elaborate on this. But notice that God, when he established marriage, when he established the multiplication process or the reproduction process, you note that there's one man and there's one woman. When God created, in other words, Adam, he created Eve to be the perfect helper for him. He didn't create Adam and Eve and Gloria. In case, you know, Eve didn't make it, at least Adam had this, you know, Gloria there that he could fall back on. He didn't create Adam and Steve and one Eve. But what he did, you know, in case Adam liked Steve more than he liked Eve, 
What he did is he created, he created a man and he created a woman and he established the monogamous principle of marriage. One man with one woman. That's God's original intent. What we have done is we've corrupted that. We still consider marriage to be the pillar of society. But rather than us having what we would call a polygamous society where we have many wives, what we have is what we call serial monogamy. We are married, but we're married to one person at a time. We may have two wives or three wives, but what we've done is we have divorced one and we've moved into a second marriage, then a third marriage, some four marriages and five, some six and seven. Some of the Hollywood stars you notice have seven and eight marriages. And they get front page news in the Hollywood star and other reputable magazines like that. <laughs> And it says, is Liz going for number eight? <laughs> and everybody wonders with bated breath, is she? You know, I have to buy every issue just to find out. <laughs> and it's serial monogamy. One at a time, one at a time. But you go through six or seven of them while you're going through it. God originally creates, and we'll see this in chapter two, God created man to be completed by woman. God created woman for the man, but man can't exist without the woman. And God created us so that we could be one in him. Because we were human beings, man speaking as a man, I was incomplete without my wife. And my wife was incomplete without her husband. And so God created us in order that we might be complemented, in order that we might be able to fit together, neatly together, glued together, in order that God could use us to multiply and to replenish the earth. I find that that is the one commandment that we all will keep very easily. Multiply. <laughs> it's the one commandment that man has kept pretty faithfully. And I believe that we would have disobeyed God had God not made it a pleasurable experience to do it. I really do. I think that God made the physical satisfaction that a man and a woman have together because he knew that we'd be disobedient. Had he not. So it's the one thing that man is constantly trying to do is to reproduce. And it's only proper in the context of marriage because that's God's original design. I'll get into that next week more specifically. But God created man and said, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to subdue it. Because man needed to be busy. He, wasn't, he was not created just to lay around. He was created to be busy. And God created us to be busy. Unfortunately, many of us men are so busy that we neglect that mate God gave to us. See, God created man to be a worker. You know, not to sweat and toil and to, to plant grass seeds and have weeds come up, because that's a result of sin. That's a curse on the earth. But man is not created just to lay around. So Adam had a job. He would name the animals. You know, he'd take care of the garden. It gave him something to do. You know, eight to five, he'd come home. He'd say, what would you do? Well, I named 500 animals today. And she said, well, that's great. You know, <laughs> Let's talk about it. <laughs> so he had something to do constantly. God created him to do that. So he didn't want us just to lay around. But we were busy. We were involved in being in fellowship with God and with, with his mate. I'm certain that they had a beautiful time going. In verse 29, the Bible says, God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the earth, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there's life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. God's original creation was vegetarian. There's no mention of them killing animals and eating them until you see Noah. But you do see sacrifice taking place, and I'll get into that a little. See, I keep getting ahead, but you don't see man eating meat. God, when we were originally created, it's very obvious we were created as vegetarians. We ate vegetarian food. Now, does that mean that we should be, in order to get back to closeness to God, all vegetarians? No, and I thank God, because I love steaks. <laughs> And I just, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I don't know, I'd die, you know. <laughs> that would be hard. You know, but meat does not commendeth unto God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the less. And I praise God that we can eat those steaks, if you like them, which I do. So anyway, originally though, the creation was, was vegetarian, and they ate the herbs and the fruits and in verse 31, it says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. 
So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And as we get into chapter 2 next week, you are going to see the first thing God pronounces as being not good. Everything at this point is recognized as being good. God looks at the entire creation and he pronounces it as being just right. He's saying this is good. But as we get into chapter 2, he's going to make his first pronouncement, the first thing that wasn't good.